the road of peace before us. Build it wide and deep and long. Speed the slow and check the eager. Help the weak and curb the strong. None shall push aside another. None shall let another fall. March beside me, O oh my brothers. All for one and one. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, out there in YouTube land for another edition of the Rising Tide Foundation Dialogues, where today I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Edward Lozanski. I, uh, just to say a few words of intro, I and my wife Cynthia had known about uh, Dr. Lozanski for a number of years through the, the conferences that he'd organized um, with his various organizations like the World Russia Forum um, in Washington, D.C., where uh, conferences br bringing together politicians, experts, um, dealing with dialogue, development of the Arctic, the Bering Strait Rail Tunnel were always showcased and very prominent uh, and were always points of, of a lot of edification and, and hope. Um, more recently, we had the great pleasure through a mutual friend, uh, Martin Seif, a journalist in the U.S. who introduced us uh, last year. Um, and Cynthia and I had the pleasure of getting to know you a little bit more directly and also participating in the wonderful Elba Day event of 2020, where we were surprised to show up and, and you know, we gave a few remarks in support of it. Uh, and other people who were on surprised us, like Maria Zakharova uh, addressed it, as well as two Russian cosmonauts from space directly also addressed the event with... Um, high-level military statesmen, other figures from both the USA, from Europe, from Russia, who are all uh, remembering together the, the importance of Elba, the Elba meeting in Germany, uh, which really signaled a shift not only for the defeat of Nazism, but also a hope for a new age of brotherhood of US-Russia relations. Um, so the rekindling of that was just so important, and it's even more important today, a year later, as things have de decayed diplomatically to a point where the, th the serious danger of a third world war, this, this one being nuclear, is, is very high. Um, so we're gonna say a few words a little bit later in this interview about your current plans or the current Elba Day event, which will be happening in about 10 days uh, time. But before we do that, um, Ed, I would like you to speak a little bit to our audience and just say, how is it that a man who was a nuclear physicist teaching in Russia found himself in the unlikely position of being a back channel diplomat of sorts between US and Russian uh, statesmen throughout the 1980s, 90s, to the point that you found yourself as a world citizen and real peacemaker um, to the present day. So how did that shift happen and how did you find yourself where you were? At the age of 14, I was studying in high school in the city of Kyiv, Ukraine. This place is now in the news, daily news, and some think that this can be the place where World War III may start. Uh, God forbid, I, I hope that this can happen. But in the news, uh, well, uh, Ukraine now, some, many people didn't know in Ukraine what it is, but now it may become like a Serbia uh, for World War I or Poland for World War II. And uh, now um, I hope and pray this will happen. But I was born in this place and um, at the age of 14, I uh, um, uh, read a book by Robert Young, American author, who uh, its title is The Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. It's about the explosion of atomic bomb, mm. which was developed in the Los Alamos lab, who was um, and the father of um, atomic bomb, Robert Oppenheimer. And this really book, uh, I was fascinated uh, by it, and I thought I will be a nuclear physicist. So um, uh, after I graduated from high school in Ukraine, in Kyiv, I went to Moscow to see the, to the best place where you can get to become a nuclear physicist. Uh, and um, uh, not immediately, but uh, after a couple of attempts, I um, entered the most prestigious uh, university which uh, trained nuclear physicists. It's called National Research Nuclear University. Um, and um, I graduated, 
and was accepted to uh, graduate school, even more prestigious, called Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Energy. It's the equivalent of Los Alamos Lab. It's a place where, uh, no name Kurchatov, it's father, like Robert Oppenheimer, he was father of uh, Soviet atomic bomb. So I reached really, uh, you know, it was great career uh, in front of me. Uh, but then um, at the same time, physicists, uh, sometimes they are, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, pe people who don't really accept uh, things, which they think that something is wrong. Uh, if you know, drop it on Oppenheimer, get in big trouble. And in our lab, a similar lab in Moscow, physicists also get in trouble uh, as well for criticizing uh, Soviet uh, policy. And especially the peak of this was 68, uh, because 68, um, Soviet Union invaded Prague, because Prague, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, General Secretary of the Communist Party was ex you know, experimenting with uh, idea that socialism can be um, uh, together, developed together with freedom, uh, with socialism with human face. Soviet Union didn't like it, and sent troops, and the Prague Spring was crashed, um, and uh, we didn't like it at all. We criticized it openly, but our, of course, uh, room was tapped. The same thing as Robert Oppenheimer in this book. Uh, it was also tapped. You know, always we, we're moving in the same parallel universes. Um, what the FBI yeah. was doing on its scientists and what the KGB was doing on its scientists were, you're saying, very, very similar. Uh, I had the problem to find a job, so I made some money by tutoring. And then make this uh, I eventually, what happened, uh, I married uh, through tutoring a daughter of the man who actually was in charge of this invasion to Prague. This is, but then uh, I get in trouble again because the general didn't like uh, that I also continue to express my dissident views. They thought that once I become part of the Soviet nomenclatura with all those privileges, and we had a lot of those privileges, then I was shut up. But I have many friends uh, who still were in trouble because they were expressing uh, you know, their own opinion, criticized the Communist Party. Some of them went to jail. Some of them went to mental institutions. Some were thrown out of the country. Eventually, I became a problem for my father-in-law because uh, you know, his career also was in jeopardy mm -hmm. because his son-in-law is a troublemaker. So uh, they, I was given the choice. Either I was shut up and become loyal communist and you know at least at least on paper uh, well, uh, or um, uh, I simply can go uh, whatever I did already could serve like five or seven years in jail or I can be put in mental institution or simply uh, get out of the country so this was the choice so um, my wife and I we talked about it and we agreed that okay let me instead from all those choices probably the best for me to leave Soviet Union, and then she will join me later on if uh, you know, uh, we will try to do everything possible to get her out as well. Right. It was a very risky operation, very risky. And, but, I, and I read your autobiography, uh, Building Bridges, which people should buy. Actually, I'll, I'll make a link in our, our video section below this <laughs> video. But you made the point that part of your getting out involved in negotiation with, with her father um, that you divorce with the promise mm -hmm. that after a year or so of you being politically inactive, you would, mm -hmm. the promise was that she would be then released also from Russia. You could rejoin, remarry, and live right, happily right. ever after, which was yeah. part of the, the plan, right? Sure. And uh, no, uh, my wife uh, trusted her father. Um, and uh, that's why we agreed that uh, the best thing for us is uh, instead of going to jail uh, uh, or mental institution or, or become like a loyal communist, it's better for me to leave and then try to get uh, my wife. We already had a child uh, at the time. She was um, five years old. Um, so I went uh, to America. I immediately was hired by a laser fusion lab in the University of Rochester, because this was my narrow field. I was working on laser fusion. Mm -hmm. The same thing that Edward Teller worked. Edward Teller was father of H-bomb. Actually, I met him <laughs> uh, when I went to uh, America. But uh, so I was hired. Uh, my professional life was great, but my wife uh, was still detained. Uh, and um, it took us six years uh, to uh, finally succeed. And she came in 82. It was front page of every major newspaper in America. 
uh, front page New York Times, Washington Post, all that was happy uh, ending, like American way, book, <laughs> movie, all, all this stuff. So, uh, but then uh, during those six years, of course, I was teaching the research, I was teaching at the university, but my main thing was to bring my family, my wife and my daughter. And for that, I had to leave my job at the University of Rochester. I had to be in Washington because Washington is a place where you can do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a job at American University in DC. Uh, but my main thing was I was staying almost every day with a poster protest outside of Soviet embassy, demanding release of my wife. And also I was going from office to office on Capitol, Capitol Hill, asking members of Congress to sign petition. I went to the State Department. It even was able to get into the White House, not, in, not immediately to, at that time was to President Carter, but to his aides. Uh, so I became more or less like full-time uh, lobbyist, but lobbyist, uh, no, not for money, but lobbyist for my family. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it took us six years. By the time it, it's a it's a long story, but yeah, no, it, and, and it, you also go through in your book how you were an international uh, figure in, in many ways because you would take your savings and you would fly around the world whenever you could yeah. to various other uh, uh, campaigning not only in Washington but in Paris and uh, Stockholm when the, during the uh, Olympic um, Games um, in Lake Placid I was collecting petitions uh, uh, then also um, uh, in '79 uh, I went to so Stockholm. Uh, and Mother Teresa, she got Nobel Peace Prize. So I was able to get to Mother Teresa and she also signed the petition. So this was a, uh, so of course, didn't have too much for physics, but you know, my wife and, and child, this uh, you know, was probably more important. Um, and um, uh, then when Reagan became president, uh, I also by the time, you know, uh, get some kind of a good, good uh, PR. I was in all major news. Um, and eventually, um, Ronald Reagan, uh, he put her in, um, on special list for exchanges. So, because sometimes the, the, after arms control negotiations, there were like side talk about human rights. And uh, the United States would ask Soviets to release some kind of people um, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. And Soviet Union would exchange, uh, ask Americans to release some Soviet spy who was arrested. So mm -hmm. it was a kind of an exchange. And eventually, uh, my wife was put on, on this list. And she was exchanged. I don't know for whom. It's, it's a top secret. I didn't, I didn't want to know. But <laughs> she was exchanged. And she came uh, to Washington in 82. Again, I said, front pages, books, movies, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, by the time, I became like almost professional lobbyist. And I felt that, um, well, uh, yeah, I got my wife. Uh, but then, Andrei Sakharov, it's another, it's a, like a, a Russian Edward Teller, because you know uh, Kurchatov was Russian um, Robert Oppenheimer, atomic bomb, but Andrei Sakharov developed Soviet age bomb, mm -hmm. and so uh, in uh, and, and like Edward Teller uh, is considered to be father of age bomb um, in the United States. Right. Uh, so Sakharov was arrested, and I felt that you know I I live happily, I have my family, uh, freedom, all that stuff, but Andrei Sakharov. Uh, is now in exile, and he, and and he was he was, he was he was arrested for his political views uh, or his criticisms yeah, yeah, of, he, of yeah, the Soviet because he was boss like all Robert Oppenheimer. You know, sometimes physicists say, in addition to physics, they also have some yeah, they have know, moral moral, moral views. views. Yeah, <laughs> but he was arrested, but then he was simply in the exile. They couldn't okay. put uh, Sakharov was such a famous decorated, so they removed him from Moscow so he could meet reporters, and he went to secret city. Um, called at the time Gorky, now it's called Nizhny Novgorod, that no, no foreigners were allowed to go. So mm -hmm. at least they isolated him from, from the press and all that. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it my responsibility to bring Sakharov as well out of um, exile. And, uh, and so I formed Andrei Sakharov um, committee and we started uh, now the same way I was lobbying for my wife, I started lobbying for Andrei Sakharov and some other dissidents who were in jail. So again, it's, it's a sad story for me because from physicists, pretty, I think was pretty good physicist. Then, um, then I became like a public activist and I couldn't stop. It's just, uh, I still, of course, you know, thought I had to make my living. So I thought, of course, physics and all that. But the research, you have to concentrate. You can be physicist in research and, be, and running around 
you know, Capitol Hill and all those places. And, and, but then suddenly, suddenly, out of the blue, Gorbachev came and became general secretary, the same like Dubček. He decided to do what Dubček did in Czechoslovakia, Gorbachev. He also wanted to build communism uh, with human face. And suddenly, I got invitation from Gorbachev, not himself, but his aide, who knew me, physicist, also his name is Yuri Sipian. Uh, he was Gorbachev's science advisor, and he knew me as a physicist. And suddenly, I got invitation uh, to come to Moscow. I was actually shocked because, you know, uh, Soviet press called me enemy of the people, CIA agent, uh, all the stuff they call dissidents and all that. Suddenly, I am invited. Uh, and, and, to... and I just want to add one thing here, um, the, the, uh, which the viewers might not have caught. The, the reason why you were, I think, on the radar was that you had made um, a, a bit of a splash internationally because I saw a video of you on YouTube next, standing next to Ronald Reagan as he was announcing the creation of Sakharov Day in 1983. Right. And yeah. uh, it became um, very, something they couldn't ignore that you were not only <laughs> talking with the president and actually manifesting in the form of policy, um, but also many other leading, state, uh, leading uh, politicians in the USA were becoming your friends quickly. Um, as well yeah, as your is, incredible story, true. your Actually, wife as I well. Love it. This day, it was uh, May 21, I remember this day, but it's yeah. May 21, it's Andrei Sakharov's birthday, and he was uh, 60. And so we decided to celebrate his birthday and with a uh, special uh, event, uh, both in the White House and in the Kennedy Center, it had special, uh, you know, it was a gala, uh, with most famous musicians playing his birthday, whatever. <laughs> and I did the whole thing. I went to every you know, office uh, because, you know, uh, in America to have a day in your name, you have to be dead because you can have a day of uh, someone who is alive because otherwise all the celebrities would want to do the same. Yes. So, uh, but it was first time that the uh, national soccer of day and he was alive. Mm. And I, the, for that, we had had special... Uh, Congress resolution allowing president to do that, and I did the whole thing. <laughs> but that's why I stayed next to Ronald Reagan uh, and many other. Ted Kennedy, by the way, Ted Kennedy stayed. Senator Dole, uh, all the famous you know people, and, um, and uh, my wife at the time already was free, and she was in the audience in the Rose Garden. <laughs> so apparently, Gorbachev people saw it, and they thought the time very important. And yeah. that's why they invited me. Because I was on, on, no, I knew all the dissidents in the Soviet Union, uh, some of my friends. And also, I was you know, connected in the American establishment. So they thought that I'm very important. That's why Gorbachev told uh, Yuri Osipian, said, listen, you know this Lazansky. Bring him to Moscow. <laughs> I want to talk to him. <laughs> so so I, I, was, I was frankly afraid because I thought, they put me in jail. <laughs> right, are you walking into they a trap? Me, they, <laughs> yeah. me, they called me CIA agent. Yeah, but right. then, you know, uh, I couldn't resist. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to see my friends. Uh, and of course, Tatiana, her family, her father and her mother, all this stuff. So we just went. <laughs> and immediately, uh, Gorbachev, right-hand man, um, Alexander Yakovlev, he actually was, uh, you know, father of this perestroika and all that thing. I, we, we met, and I asked him, why do you... Why, why me? He said, because, because, because we, we, we know your biography and all that stuff. You know that you are like in between two worlds. You know everyone in Moscow, you know everyone in Washington. Help us. Help us to bring a message to uh, Ronald Reagan and to America that we, from now on, no more communist uh, uh, ideology promotion. Uh, no, we want to be part of the West. Uh, uh, no, we want to be uh, American ally, not just partner. We want to be ally. I couldn't believe what I hear. No, General Secretary, uh, then he introduced me to Gorbachev. So General Secretary of the Communist Party is telling me that he wants to be American ally, you know. So anyway, it's um, from, from now on, I thought I have a mission. I have a mission to have Russia and America. Still, it was still Soviet Union, but still uh, wants to be... Um, not just friends, but allies. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why on my website, you know, russiahouse.org, it says, from confrontation to alliance. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought that I'm insane. Uh, how you can be ally with Soviet Union? 
Um, but I said, well, uh, everyone told me I'm insane when I was trying to bring daughter. By that time, my father-in-law became four-star general. Uh, so uh, everyone thought you can't have four-star general daughter to leave. Uh, it's only, uh, you know, it's just insane. I said, well, maybe I'm insane, but I succeeded. So why not succeed in this case as well? And every year we had a meeting on Capitol Hill called US-Russia Forum. Um, uh, and uh, see, we brought, we'll bring many famous people from Moscow, uh, many, of course, members of Congress, some prominent businessmen, all that stuff. It's like a two-day forum, talk how we can become allies. And at some point, uh, we made some good progress. But um, at some, uh, I think what happened, why we failed, is that uh, we were against very powerful um, law. In other, I was kind of a you know, part <laughs> the lobbyist, kind of a uh, uh, not not paid lobbyist for, for this, my, my ideas. And there was another group uh, which was against working against us. Mm. And this group was this military industrial complex. Mm. Military industrial complex didn't want Russia as ally, didn't want Russia as a friend or partner, it wanted Russia as enemy. Yeah. Only because if this Russia is no enemy, why would we want to spend you know, hundreds of billions of dollars for all those weapons? Um, and uh, so it's- uh, You, it's you were able to, uh, in the course yeah. of your book- so We were against, not just me, President Eisenhower, <laughs> he was the first uh, right. who said that, I, I want to do many good things, but this military has some complex things. <laughs> so I, Mm -hmm. Before I said it, President Eisenhower said it. Yeah, yeah. This, is not a, this is not a Soviet uh, anti-American infiltration here. This well, is <laughs> moreover, uh, well, no, George Cannon. Uh, yeah. Everyone's now talking about George Cannon because it was kind of an anniversary of his birthday, whatever. Yeah. George Cannon, of his speech, uh, uh, famous telegram and all that. George Cannon, in 87, 87, Soviet Union still around because Soviet Union collapsed in 91. So Gen George Cannon said famous phrase, if first happen, because one day we wake up and Soviet Union is no more. Okay, it's, Soviet Union is drowned in the ocean. Then we will have to find another enemy because you know, otherwise without enemy, why would we need this military industrial complex? And actually American economy will suffer a lot because this military industrial complex also is a driver for the economy. So it's a logically, uh, well, so we, we, I have to admit that uh, so far we are failing, that we are not partners, we are not, um, of course, um, uh, no allies, but we are enemies. And today, as we speak, we expect a speech by uh, Joe Biden. And Joe Biden, just today, announced new round of sanctions. This is insane, because just a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, he invited Putin to for a meeting. And first time he said, he wants to meet like in a few months. Then he called again. He said, I want to meet faster. I want to meet you in a few days, a few, uh, me, we, we for two. And then he invited Putin to take part in this um, uh, uh, summit, ecological summit. And suddenly, uh, so usually when you invite someone for a meeting, uh, well, you bring flowers, uh, or you bring cake. <laughs> well, at least, <laughs> but, but instead of flowers or cake, or, or, or extend your hand to shake hands, every sanctions, new sanctions, enemy, it's his rhetoric. Also, uh, also uh, yeah, call, yeah, I mean, the, so the, the, famous, the famous, the famous I, I insult of that, Putin as, as being a soulless killer just a few weeks earlier as well, right, right, is right. right there on the platter. So how come you want to talk to someone and then you call him a killer and then you uh, have this uh, expelled diplomats, uh, huge, huge uh, uh, avalanche of sanctions, of course, now uh, all this talk about meeting is now the thing is we're getting now very, very close to World War III to something what we, when we started. And uh, I'm afraid that my, my birthplace, Kiev, can be like a point, the same like Warsaw uh, in um, World War II or in Serbia, uh, World War I. It, it, it's horrible. It's think. Well, uh, let me and, ask you this question then, because. Um, and it's great that you brought up the the sort of two opposing foreign policy doctrines in America, going back to the Roosevelt, uh, sorry, Eisenhower desires and his warnings of the military industrial complex, compared to what you also had to deal with in your lobbying, uh, where you were trying to bring about the better America 
that represents something which which the world uh, could des desperately needs um, as a, a bastion of freedom of of free enterprise of cooperation. That that idea was something you you confronted as well in the uh, late eighties nineties when there was a hope uh, when the Soviet Union was going through its transformation its dissolution. There was an idea and a promise being made from one component of the U.S. establishment that they would want to help Russia develop their infrastructure with a billion dollars or more of, of investments. I think it was more into infrastructure to help them sort of really uh, have a long-term strategy and have, have a relationship on that basis. And then you had this opposing part of the U.S. establishment, this military industrial side, as you, you just went through, that sabotaged that and that said, no we're just going to make sure that the Soviet Union collapses and we have a unipolar age. Uh, and that's it. That's the end of history. Uh, maybe you could say a, a little something about that before we jump back into the current events of, of World War III danger that's currently. Yes. Uh, yeah. Way. What happened after this meeting with Gorbachev? And then, of course, we know that the Soviet Union collapsed and then Yeltsin came. I brought a lot of uh, the Gorbachev people before that and Yeltsin people uh, to Washington. And I introduced them to uh, you know, Washington establishment and the, our kind of, um, the guy who I met several times was uh, Vice President Dan Quayle. And Dan Quayle was very positive uh, toward what um, we were thinking. Uh, he said, yes, maybe it will be great for America if uh, Russia uh, is our ally. So uh, I assumed that Dan Quayle was not part of this uh, military industrial complex. Maybe that's why he didn't win the elections because in '96 he was running for um, no, for the White House and uh, he didn't have the support because mm -hmm. this is some someone who wants to be friends with Russia uh, doesn't have a chance. And when Trump somehow miraculously succeeded, <laughs> then he was thrown out immediately. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that um, they say that Russia interfered in the elections, but it was <laughs> I don't know what Russia maybe did some minor things. It was like establishment. Establishment, they interfered in the elections and succeeded in the Joe Biden victory. Uh, and they, so this is, and, and of course, it's much, much easier to accuse Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever has happened, what's wrong in the United States is Putin is to blame. It's all Putin, yeah. Even this Bad weather, there's Hill, a hurricane, it's Putin. Yeah, even this uh, riot in Capitol Hill, anything that uh, is wrong, uh, Black Lives Matter riots, also Putin. Everything is Putin. But this helps, of course, um, uh, my good friend, uh, actually, I know him from the old days, Reagan days, because he was CIA uh, top uh, eight to Reagan uh, morning briefer. Uh, he would, you know, his job was in the morning when Reagan comes to the office, Ray McGovern had to put on his desk a uh, brief, morning brief, of what all the major things that happened in regard to Soviet Union, because not Soviet Union. So Ray McGovern, he's now retired, so he expanded because military industrial complex, it's M-I-C. He said, now we have another four letters and <laughs> another four letters to that. And you have to add to M-I-C, you have to uh, say uh, Congress, C, intelligence, I, academy, A, think tank, think tank, complex. So now it's uh, Mic -mic. expanded. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and I have to admit that uh, uh, I succeeded in, winning of a Soviet Union, uh, and, and actually the title of my book, and, and which uh, actually brought us some, some glory and some money actually <laughs> too. It's called The Love Triumphed Over the Kremlin. So it's called Tatiana, it's the name of my wife, but the subtitle was When Love Triumphed Over the Kremlin. So we succeeded in Soviet Union, our love, we, we won, but we are not succeeding with M I C C uh, whatever I <laughs> Mick, Mick, Mick Mac. Academy, yeah. uh, think tank. Uh, we are not succeeding. I have to admit, you know, we are not succeeding. No. Well, yeah, and this is also um, something which I think is interesting is that throughout your your career, your life, um, you have been called as you as you mentioned a KGB agent uh, by a lot of paranoid Americans. You have been called a CIA agent by a lot of paranoid Russians. And today, I mean, it's happening again where, you know, I Google your name and there's these incredible slander websites of you being a KGB uh, tool of Putin 
um, it, you know, who's infiltrated the U.S. establishment. And it's like, it, you can't get a break. You're, you're, no matter where you go, you're always being attacked by, by everybody <laughs> for being something even, that you're not. Because Julian, consistently, your you know, message has been the same uh, message. Even Julian Assange, huh? the owner of right. being quoted, someone asked Julian Assange, who is this Edward Luzansky? Tell him. Who is he? He's KGB or CIA? And Julian Sars said, you know, I can't figure out. <laughs> I, I have to admit now on this program, uh, I, I am maybe double agent, double agent for both countries. I want two countries to be allies. This is what my dream. <laughs> well, uh, but uh, this is a, well, a double agent. Right? Well, that, that's it. So I, I think that the, 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 anybody who actually looks at your work and writings and, and just judges you for your actions sees that there's a constant theme that has never changed from the beginning all the way through to the present and future, which is, again, as you just said, peace, avoid nuclear war and Holocaust, and nuclear Armageddon, and work together on common, common interest. That's, that's really been your, your life's theme Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. as a musical theme going throughout the composition. It's the same one. And uh, you'd have to really be blind and short-sighted to, or myopic to not miss that, that whole gestalt. Mm. Um, which brings us to the current events. As, as you've mentioned, we're in a very grave situation. Um, there is currently, I believe, 30,000 troops that have begun uh, mobilization on Russia's border as part of the Defender Europe uh, 2021 exercises. There's new sanctions uh, against Russia, a seeming almost intention to burn and blow up all of the potential diplomatic bridges. Um, and a lot of people are saying, oh, nuclear war is impossible. They would never, they, this, I used to believe this too, Ashley, I'll admit that. They would never let it get that bad. Don't worry. However, when you start looking at history with a critical eye, you start seeing that, no, uh, the argument that we haven't blown ourselves up yet and so it will never happen is really stupid because there's been so many instances where it was only the miraculous actions and brave actions of individuals that stopped nuclear war from already happening throughout the cold war um one should not be too comfortable but how do you respond to these people how do you how do you shake them out of their their stupor and realize the danger such that they can then begin to open up their minds and think about well what is needed what solutions uh, we should be thinking about yeah. Well, um, what we, we have, what we call, we use what we call like uh, people's diplomacy. Mm. Right? And people's diplomacy, of course, uh, it's very difficult for uh, people's diplomacy to compete with uh, this uh, monster that <laughs> we discussed with seven, eight book uh, letters, whatever. Mm. But, uh, but still, I, I feel that um, simply sit and wait until we get this uh, nuclear war, uh, uh, it's not in my nature. So we try to do what we can. And one thing is we're trying to find, I'm teaching a course now, uh, US-Russia relations, and to my students, and now with the help of um, you know, Zoom, uh, we can, uh, this, uh, any students from any place, don't, not necessarily only my group, but any student can sign up and all that. We are talking about what we as individuals, private individuals, uh, can do. And um, we thought that maybe mm, uh, one idea uh, which, uh, uh, which comes to mind, and we actually already did many things on that, is um, April 25, which is coming pretty soon. Uh, April 25, 1945 was a high point. When you're talking about allies, we, we were allies. Uh, we were allies uh, in April, well, not only in April, but during the World War II, at least uh, last uh, two years when uh, there was a uh, no, second front uh, from, um, United States uh, and uh, the city in Torgau in Germany, Elbe River, um, American troops were advancing from the west, Soviets uh, from the east. And what happened is for me, it's also personal because both my father in law, Tatiana, and my own father, th they were in this group of Soviet uh, military advancing and they met Americans. It was a really great time. It was a dancing, singing, embracing, drinking, of course, you know. It's a very emotional. Uh, you, you, there are plenty of photographs of this little thing, and uh, in, in my our parents, my wife, and were in this group. This is so for us. It's really, really personal. So that's why we get work allies because we were allies in '45. So that's why my, my motto is "But not allies again." Uh, so we every day, every year, when it's April, we try to bring Americans together. And um, uh, and we, you know, 
succeeded many times. We had in Moscow, American embassy uh, personnel uh, to come to this end. Um, and uh, in Washington, uh, American officials, State Department come to this event. So we had simultaneous events. Uh, and then we became we using a teleconference uh, where people from Moscow would um, speak and uh, to Americans, Americans would speak to Russians. Uh, it's great. So now uh, what's happening next? Um, we came up with the idea. Uh, actually, I have to thank Joe Biden now from all of it because Joe Biden, is, he called, <laughs> he decided to do on April, also April, but April 22 and 23 ecological uh, seminar or, or summit. And he met Putin in Xi Jinping and the 30, uh, total 40 leaders, uh, including Xi Jinping and, and Putin, to talk about how we can save planet uh, from climate change. I said, okay, now, uh, so you do it 22, 23. What about on 25, we do the following thing. We do also like celebration of usual annual celebration, but we do it with planting trees. Because if you plant a tree, every tree you plant, it absorbs certain amount, small of course, certain amount of uh, CO2. Uh, but if you plant a trillion tree, trillion tree, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then you can reduce by maybe fifty percent uh, all this um, concentration of CO two, and this is uh, science. It's science. It's not like a right. kind of a wishful thinking. Yeah, We're yeah. talking about science. Exactly. So we thought that what we're going to do now, not simply make speeches, put flowers, uh, honor veterans, but we also will plant a tree, and we'll call for the world, not just forty leaders, but the whole mankind, two hundred twenty. Uh, countries which belong to UN, at this day also plant trees. And start this compare, of course, to plant a trillion trees, uh, it takes time. It's probably need 10 years, whatever. But we have to start this process. Well, and I think that that's the important idea uh, symbolically of the, the theme of having uh, trees uh, planted uh, to celebrate brotherhood and peace is that it's about the future. And you're taking a very proactive approach to the idea of what Biden says is his big priority, um, rather than the uh, uh, some people are saying, oh, no, no, we should shut down industrial civilization as a solution to stopping CO2 mm -hmm. emissions. And you're, you're, you're providing a very nice contrast saying, no, how about, we, <laughs> how about we, we don't do that? And instead, let's build these trees that have multiple purposes, providing oxygen, receiving CO2, and give it, creating symbolic meaning of peace yeah. and cooperation with deep roots for everybody. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that that's a much, much healthier approach to climate change than, than some of the other we, ideas. We're not we're doing this. We're not losing jobs. We're adding jobs. Exactly. Because we plant the tree on trees. <laughs> we create a lot of jobs. What? And you don't, so, well, yeah. we'll see how it goes. But so far, I see tremendous response. Tremendous response from people around the world, from India, from China, from Latin America. So it's really picking up. Good. We'll see and how it goes. But it, today, great news today that we were giving most beautiful most prestigious location in Moscow uh, to plant this tree. It's a right. place where people, you know, it's a park. Uh, just, it's really the most, most, I don't know what to compare, well, maybe like Central Park in, in New York, really most, most famous, famous event. So we're going to uh, plant uh, trees in this place. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we'll have teleconference. And so people from any place, doesn't matter where you are, you can be in uh, Latin America, China, Canada, of course, <laughs> any place. You plant a tree uh, and then you make a short video and then send it to us and we'll post it. Uh, of course, you can post it on your social network, but we'll post it on, on the website, which will have hopefully million, of uh, several million likes and, and videos. So this is something that uh, campaigns we're going to start on uh, Sunday, April 25. Well, and, and uh, certainly on that point, uh, Cynthia uh, Chung, my wife and myself, will be, will be certainly doing that this weekend. We'll be planting a tree, uh, delivering a little message to video and sending it your way. And, and um, for anybody who is listening, um, and also as a, before I have you tell people how they can also participate, where they should go to the, which website to sign up and, and uh, send their video to you. Um, I just want to make a point that this uh, proposition of yours, this uh, planted trillion trees, was something that you uh, initiated with some colleagues of yours a few years ago, and it got to the point where 
Um, it was even picked up by President, former President Trump himself, um, who endorsed this at the World Economic yeah. Forum of last year, which was, was a amazing. Surprise. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that was yeah. The, that was good. The, this is amazing because uh, yeah, a couple of my friends and I we had. Uh, I'm also like uh, writing columns for Washington Times, um, and um, we run this column and say, "What a good idea! If you plant a trillion trees, then uh, this will save you know, our planet." without cutting jobs and all that. So then um, next, uh, almost next day, Trump went to Davos. Uh, it was like scheduled, like it was in February sometime. In, the, in the Davos, he said, you know what? I'm going to plant trillion trees. <laughs> Trump, I, know, I don't know. I, I wish that he did it because he read my article. Washington Times actually, it's the only paper that supported Trump. So maybe Trump read it. Uh, because sometimes you want to read not only nasty things about you from New York Times, but you can post. Sometimes you want to read something good. So he saw my article. I would, I don't know. I, anyway, I think that's, it's, it, it's a likely, it's a likely hypothesis. It's a strong yeah. hypothesis. He said um, it, that was, but then he came to Washington, and next day he had addressed to the nation. It was the State of the Union, and he repeated the same thing. Yes, yeah, he repeated, said, "I'm going to plant." It. Moreover, he formed um, a special department, a Department of Interior called Trillion Trees Department. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it still exists because Biden, when he came- Probably he not. Canceling, he, yeah. he, started, <laughs> he was canceling everything. But uh, I think the important thing is that it was installed in the zeitgeist. It was, it was something that was infused into the psyche of the people that created a new set of potentials in the mind and the imagination of the collective, which is very important because you need that, that space of the mind in order to begin to move and make action and policy. So I think that that was very important that your work cultivated in that and, and will continue coming out of this Elba Day event to continue to grow that space um, in which dialogue can occur. Now, for people listening, um, who would like to participate, either to watch, to say a, a remark on video that they could send to you, or uh, just share the message. How do they get in touch with you? How do they very, very easy. help today? Website, russiahouse.org. Uh, Russiahouse.org. Uh, Russia House. The same as uh, John Le Carre. <laughs> no. <laughs> so russiahouse.org. Uh, and uh, you, they'll see a uh, link called U.S. Russia Forum, uh, and U.S. Russia Forum has all this information and also you know, how to get additional information, sign up and all that stuff. So it's a simple thing uh, okay. to, to join. Great. And so what we'll do, uh, everybody who would like to know the full story, um, we're going to do another, uh, maybe in a few weeks time, we'll do another follow-up uh, interview to go through your bio a little bit more. But until then, if people can't wait, uh, Go to the, the description in, in under this video. I will have a link for anyone to purchase your uh, Building Bridges autobiography, which is a wonderful read, um, and to get the full story, of, of which is just an, an incredible adventure. Um, additionally, I'm going to include the video, the, the short five-minute video of Ronald Reagan's speech in 1983 with a younger uh, Ed Lozanski with a, uh, a different color, <laughs> a different hue of hair. Um, <laughs> Uh, standing right next to him. Um, so that'll be something people can watch and uh, a link to your website uh, to Russia House as well so people can can get involved. So thank you so much, Dr. Lozanski, for uh, joining us and uh, hopefully we'll do another one very soon. The setting of the melody from the choral section of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony to the words by Schiller, all men are brothers, alla menschen werden Brüder. Praise to joy the God descended, daughter of Elysium, ray of mirth and rapture blended, goddess to thy shrine we come, by thy magic is united, what stern custom parted why all mankind are brothers plighted. Where thy gentle wings abide. Freude, schöne Götter, 
Erfunken, Tochter aus Elysium, der betreten Feuer trunken, himmlische dein Heiligtum, deiner Zauber binden wieder, was die Mode streng geteilt, alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein sanfter Fliegel weilt. Will the road of peace be for us, build it wide and deep and long, speed the slow and check the eager, help the weak and keep the strong. None shall push aside another, none shall let another fall. March beside me, oh my brothers, all for one and one.